Shalom, saints, and thank you for joining us for our Searching the Scriptures episode. Each Thursday, we gather with the expectation that Jehovah is going to meet with us here. And so I want you to grab something to write with, grab something to write on, and of course, grab your Bible and prepare yourself for some inspirational teachings, quotes you can use, and of course, the truth that set men free. So stay tuned for Searching the Scriptures. Shalom, saints. The last thing Yeshua said to his disciples before he ascended was go and make disciples of all nations. This command is known as the Great Commission. Our ministries have taken this commission very seriously and developed a discipleship training program that will change the way discipleship has been done up to now. Most discipleship training programs are denominational in their approach and is doing exactly what the Pharisees and Sadducees did in the days of Yeshua. Yeshua said, you search the world over to find one proselyte and you make them twice the son of hell as they were before you found them. The vision of Arthur Bailey Ministries and House of Israel is to be a worshiping people, an evangelistic community, a discipleship center, an equipping network, and a worldwide witness for Yeshua, the Messiah. In fulfillment of the Great Commission, we've developed Discipleship101.tv. Discipleship101.tv is a two-year seminary-level discipleship training program that takes a Messianic Hebrew roots approach to the scriptures. Now that we've completed this program, we are making it available to people around the world for free. We now have the opportunity to get it into every federal and state prison library and libraries around the nation. We also have the potential for getting this program accredited in universities and Bible colleges around the country. Now here's where we need your help. We need you to stand with us at the $1,500 level to help us get these workbooks printed and DVDs printed and duplicated in order to get them placed in prison libraries around the nation. For your help, we wanna bless you with all of the workbooks and DVDs for each class as a thank you for helping us get this valuable information out. For your partnership, you will get all eight workbooks and all of the DVDs by partnering with us today at the $1,500 level. Thank you in advance for helping us get this valuable, extensive, Messianic Hebrews discipleship training program to the nations of the world. By doing so, we're doing exactly what Yeshua said to do when he commissioned us to make disciples of the nation. Join us in this most important mission of making disciples of the nation by partnering with us today at the $1,500 level. You can partner with us at this level by sending your partnership check or money order to House of Israel. If you would like to pledge your partnership with us and make payments, please do so on our website at www.arthurbaileyministries.com. Just let us know you would like to make a pledge and make payments. Please help us get this material published so it can be placed in prison libraries and libraries around the nation. Partner with us today at the $1,500 level. 
Thank you. Shalom, I'm Arthur Bailey, Chancellor of the accredited Hebrew Roots University. Hebrew Roots University is the world's first and only accredited theological university that approaches scripture from a messianic Hebrew Roots perspective. I'm excited to inform you that Hebrew Roots University is open for admission. Please check out our newly designed innovative website at HebrewRootsUniversity.com. At Hebrew Roots University, you can earn an accredited associate's, bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degree in several disciplines. We have kept our website design simple, making it easy to navigate to what really matters, and that is our degree courses. Please take a moment and peruse through the pages of our website at HebrewRootsUniversity.com. When you're ready to take the first step on this exciting educational theological journey, simply click the Apply Now button and follow the instructions. If you have any questions at any time during the application process, please do not hesitate to reach out to our admissions team using the Got Questions section at the bottom of our website. We look forward to walking with you on this exciting journey. So check us out now at HebrewRootsUniversity.com. That's HebrewRootsUniversity.com. Shalom. House of Israel International Services are held weekly at 3601 Rose Lake Drive, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28217, 11 a.m. Saturday mornings and 7 p.m. Thursday evenings, Eastern Time. This live broadcast is made possible through financial contributions from brothers and sisters like you. Your financial support is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Motivating. Inspiring, challenging, encouraging, deepening, strengthening, and enhancing your faith. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to House of Israel International's live worship service. Well, Shalom, Shalom, Saints. Welcome to our Searching the Scriptures Thursday. Today, we're going to deal with um, childbirth and purification. This is probably one of the most neglected um, responsibilities of human creation, uh, known to man, if you would. We're going to look at um, Leviticus chapter 12, verse 1 through 8. In fact, as some of you all remember, when we started doing the teaching, uh, the study, of Leviticus, um, I, I said it was one of those books of the Bible that, you know, 
I found no interest whatsoever in reading. And in church, it was, I don't think in all my days of being in church did I ever hear a teaching from Leviticus. I don't remember one. And in studying and memory verses and all of the things that we were required to remember, I don't ever remember a memory verse coming from Leviticus. In fact, it seems as if the preachers that I do and the churches that I was a part of avoided Leviticus like it in itself was a plague. <laughs> and so as we're going through Leviticus, I could see why many people are totally oblivious to what the Almighty required from his creation when he came down to childbirth and purification. In fact, when it comes down to purification in itself and distinguishing between what is clean and what is unclean, what is holy and what is unholy, is something that is important to the Almighty as it, respect, as it relates to him desiring to dwell among his people. So we're going to be looking at this particular chapter, and this chapter uh, in Leviticus 12 is going to allude to Leviticus 15, which we won't get to for another three chapters, but we're going to touch on it briefly today because we're going to have to based on what is stated uh, in the early verses of this particular chapter. Now, interesting too, Leviticus is only eight verses. Leviticus chapter 12 is only eight verses long, but it is so filled with information and knowledge that pulls together a lot of scripture, even in the New Testament. Those of us who've been going through the book of Luke, we know that Mary, when she finished her purification process, that she was required to go up to Jerusalem. And this is where Simeon and Anna began to prophesy over the, over the child Yeshua. And so we're going to look at a little bit of that as well. But we're going to be studying from Leviticus chapter 12, 1 through 8. And again, the subject matter, childbirth and purification. For those of you who are joining us online, we appreciate if you would take a moment and subscribe to our website. If you're on our website, those of you who are here who have your smart devices, you can do that as well. You can watch us on YouTube. For those of you who are joining us on YouTube, please take a moment and like and subscribe to our YouTube channel if you're on Facebook. If you would do that, we certainly would appreciate it. Now, we've been noticing our numbers inch up. Uh, it would be nice if they, you know, kind of jumped up, but inching up is fine. So those of you who are, you know, taking uh, what I'm saying serious, you're really helping us get the message out and expose these important teachings to a broader uh, a broader audience. So if you take a moment, like and share our videos and posts, we'd appreciate it. At the end of t teaching today, as with all teachings, you'll be given an opportunity to ask questions, to give, and then to receive prayer. The vision of House of Israel is to be a worshiping people, an evangelistic community, a discipleship center, an equipping network, and a worldwide witness for Yeshua the Messiah. Our declaration for Jehovah's blessings I declare this is my season for peace, power, promises, and prosperity. I declare the peace of Jehovah in my life and in my body. I declare the power of Jehovah to manifest fully in my life. I declare the promises of Jehovah fulfilled in my life. I declare the prosperity of Jehovah to permeate every area of my life. And I declare I will walk in obedience to Jehovah every day of my life. Father, as we've gathered in this place Today, we've gathered with the expectation that you would join with us. We welcome your presence in the midst of us. We ask as we go through this particular chapter of Leviticus that you will reveal to us your truth, that you will reveal to us your instructions and help us to comprehend what you reveal to us that we may be able to apply your instructions in our lives. Even as we quote, Father, our declaration for your blessings, we know that embedded in your word that obeying your commands will bring all of the things that we confess according to 
our declaration. We know that it is your desire to prosper your people. It is your desire, Father, to give your people, even as you brought them out of the land of bondage into a land flowing with milk and honey, to give them houses they didn't build, land, wells they didn't dig, trees they didn't plant, vineyards they didn't plant. And you desire to reveal yourself to your people, knowing that by the establishing of wealth in the earth for your people, you would establish the covenant you made with your people. And Father, help us to enter into your covenants, to walk, to, to walk in your covenant, to have the knowledge and understanding and how to apply your covenant even in our lives today. And so we bless you. And as we go through this teaching today, again, reveal yourself to us. Give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear and the ability to comprehend. Forgive us of our sins, our transgressions. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness, creating us clean hearts. Renew the right spirit in us. We declare this ground to be holy, this people to be holy, as we present ourselves to you, the Holy One. So be glorified in the midst of us. Let your kingdom come. Your will be done in Messiah Yeshua. And we bind every assignment of the enemy and decree no weapons formed against us shall prosper. We, dr we, we, we come against every assignment. We, we pray, Father, for every lie, for every false teaching and false doctrine, false messaging that has been given by others and have taken or found some foundation in the hearts and minds of your people, that everything that is not of you be uprooted thrown down and cast out in Yeshua's name. So again, be glorified in the midst of us in Yeshua's name. Amen. So again, we're going through Leviticus chapter 12. It's a short verse, uh, short eight verses, but we're going to be uh, pulling in some other scripture because this particular chapter speaks to a lot of that, um, and you'll see as we go through. Jehovah's instructions to his people were given to remind them that it was he who brought them up out of the land of Egypt to be their Elohim. He repeatedly reminded them that they were to be holy as he is holy and for them to make a difference between the unclean and the clean. It was and is imperative for his people to follow his instructions so that he may dwell amongst us in harmony with us. And we have to remember as we're going through his word that he, he ain't no different than he was then. He's the same today as he was yesterday and shall be forever. The ability to conceive and give birth to a child is a privilege given to mankind by Jehovah. Now, individuals who have had no problem having children, to them, it may seem as if it's an easy thing to do. For those who have tried and worked and worked and had difficulty giving birth or even conceiving, they know that this is not the easiest thing to do. It's sometimes questionable how the Almighty allow people to have children who don't seem to be concerned or care about them, even to the point of wanting to have an abortion and end their lives. And yet there are those who desire to have children desperately, for whatever reason, are hindered in doing so. What we know from Scripture is that everything in the earth, if the Almighty don't allow it, it won't happen. And therefore... It is he who gives us the ability to do whatever it is that we do. And as we're going through Leviticus, we're going to see that that is certainly the case. Jehovah's instructions on childbirth and purification were a continuation of the laws that identified the clean and uncleanness amongst the people. And so in this portion, we're going to look at his instructions to families and the priests, what they are to do when a woman has conceived and gives birth to a male or a female child. Many of us have been so removed from the Old Testament, as it's called, and the commandments of Jehovah, to where these things are not even a second thought for most people. I know that for me, it certainly wasn't the case. In chapter 12, verse 1, it opens with, and the Lord spoke. 
unto Moses, saying, I have to remind people, especially New Testament, so-called New Testament believers who believe that the Old Testament is for the Jewish people, that Jehovah spoke. And individuals who are of a New Testament mindset would certainly confess that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And they look at the Old Testament as something that is written, not spoken. The prophets, when they spoke, they heard from the Almighty. Jehovah spoke to the prophets, and the prophets spoke to the people. Everything Moses wrote, we see Jehovah speaking. And this is one of the reasons why I continue to remind us as we're going through Leviticus, uh, as we went through Exodus, that Jehovah spoke. What Moses wrote is what he spoke, is what Jehovah spoke. So Moses didn't go up in the mountain and decide to put together a bunch of laws for the children of Israel. <laughs> Moses was summoned in the mountain and was given the laws for this new nation and how it was to conduct itself and how it was to set itself apart from all the other nations in the earth. Verse 2 says, speak unto the children of Israel, saying, if, if a woman have conceived. Now, as we were going through um, the Bible, especially as we were going through Genesis, we noticed that several of the patriarch wives had a hard time conceiving a child. Sarah was barren for many, many years. And so we, we know that when it came down to the conception of a child, it wasn't the easiest thing to do for some people. And for many, they considered it being barren was to be accursed of Jehovah. Of course, the Almighty honored Sarah and others, as we will see, or we've seen. If a woman have conceived seed and born a male child, then she shall be unclean. How many days? Seven. Now, what we're going to look at when we're going through this particular passage, it's important that we don't add to, that we don't isogete or read into the Scripture that we don't take away from what is written because what will happen oftentimes is that people will begin to put their take or their teachings or their understanding and read them into the word and make the word say something that the word doesn't say. And so it's important as we note that every word is important. Jehovah spoke and therefore, we want to make sure that we understand exactly what he said so that we can, we can do exactly what he said. Then she shall be unclean seven days. According to the days of the separation for her infirmity, shall she be unclean. Now, I underline these words. Some of you all remember when we were going through discipleship, I talked about this Bible, which was a keyword study Bible. And in the keyword study Bible, the author of the Bible highlighted or under, underlined certain words in a passage that they thought were key. Now, there wasn't a whole lot of key words in the Old Testament, if I recall. Most of those key words were in the New Testament writings. But what I've done is I wanted to highlight certain words that is important for us to take note of as we're going uh, through these, these verses. So if a woman have conceived seed, now this word conceived is different than the words conceived before this particular passage. This word is connected to conceived seed, whereas other passages where they conceived, they conceived. But here we see conceived seed. Now, and born a male child, and I'm pointing that out because the woman cannot have a child unless there is a seed that she conceives from. She cannot have a child on her own. And if she have conceived seed and born a man child, then she shall be unclean seven days according to the days of the separation for her infirmity shall she be unclean. Now, this, is, this verse is packed. One, when it comes down 
to the man child, she'll be unclean seven days. When we get to the female child, she's going to be unclean for two weeks, so it's twice the time. According to the days of separation for her infirmity. This word separation is where we get the word nida. Now, this is a word I never heard of nida until I came into Torah. Now, I've heard of menstrual cycle, the women, women in her cycle, um, and, and, and those kinds of things. But when it comes down to the actual word, what the word separation here is, is nida. Oftentimes, people see that word separation, and they take it into places where it shouldn't go. I remember talking to some individuals, especially individuals where there were more than one woman, <laughs> you know, that they were married to. And when, when one of them became um, um, on her menstrual, they separated her from everybody else. And people, even in Christianity, I remember people talking about just like a leper, you know, when a leper is a leprous, they have to be removed from the camp. Folks were going even as far as saying when a woman was nida because of the separation that she had to actually be removed from the camp. But that's not what this word says. That's not what this passage says. According to the days of the separation for infirmity shall she be unclean. The woman of the scriptures or women, thought I'd corrected that, of scripture recognized that the child they carried was from Jehovah and not from themselves. Now, this is important because if a woman think that the child she carries or the man thinks that the child the woman carries are theirs, then there's a problem. There's a problem because they're going to do what their culture teaches versus what Jehovah teaches. And oftentimes, I've never, in all of my days of growing up and the people that I were around, no one that I know or knew followed the instructions concerning a woman in childbearing. No one that I knew. Mrs. Adams said that the child she had was given by Jehovah. Now, she, she, she went a little extreme, but this is what she said. And Adam knew Eve, his wife. Now, Adam knew Eve, and she conceived and bare, bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from who? From Jehovah. From Jehovah. Every child, according to this statement, even the one that is born out of wedlock, I know people might have a hard time with that, that a woman cannot conceive unless the Almighty gives her the ability to conceive. When it comes down to what she said, although it was Adam who the seed came from, she confessed, I have gotten a man from Jehovah. Now, when Cain killed his brother Abel and he was banned or, or, or exiled, in verse 25 of Genesis 4, um, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. And this is what she said, for God says, she has appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. So the first one, she said she got a man from Jehovah. And, and it's based on the third child, it would be easy to conclude that the second child came from Jehovah as well. So the third child, she says, is from Elohim that he has appointed. Now, it's Adam who's doing the work, <laughs> but it's, the, it's, it's Elohim who's causing that work to produce. The seed in Adam, like all seed producing plants and animals, were given by Jehovah. A woman cannot produce a child without the seed of a man. Now, I'm pointing all of this out and emphasizing it so that we understand that every one of us, based on the creative order, comes from Jehovah. Now, whether a person yield themselves to that knowledge 
or take their lives hostage as if it belongs to them and not acknowledge the creator, that's where the problem comes from. Because every person in the earth came from the Almighty. The psalmist tells us the earth is Jehovah's, the fullness thereof, and all, not some, but all. It would be hijacking our lives to take our lives and to live our lives as if it was ours to live however we chose. That would not be recognizing the creator who gives life. And just as the creator gives life, the creator is going to hold us accountable for the life he has given. This is why every man is going to have to give an account. So a woman cannot produce a child without the seed of a man. It takes two. This is why gay men who marry one another and lesbian women who marry one another are an abomination before Jehovah because they cannot produce a child amongst themselves. Two men cannot produce children. Two women cannot produce children. Everything Father created that has life has the ability to produce after its kind. But when it comes to human beings, it means a male and a female has to come together in order for a child to be produced. Now, the Almighty established an order as to how that's supposed to be because the man and the woman should be married. They shouldn't be having sex outside of marriage. There shouldn't be fornication among Father's creation. But when people take their lives as if it's theirs, they do with it whatever they want to do without acknowledging him. And many of us have been guilty of this. It's not for us to dwell on our guilt and the wrongs that we've done, but to acknowledge the wrongs that we've done, repent from those wrongs, and do what is right, and then instruct future generations as to what is right opposed to what is wrong. Now, let me say this, because some people may think, okay, well, what if I was born and I wasn't born to a, to a husband and wife? What if I was born out of wedlock? Well, that's your parents' problem. <laughs> that's not your problem. Your issue is that you make sure you don't make the same mistakes your parents made. So there's no guilt or condemnation upon you unless you take it upon yourself. Your job, if your parents didn't do what they should have done, don't follow in the footsteps of your parents. Do what is right before, the, before his sight. Amen? Homosexuality and lesbianism are unnatural and goes against creation. The acts they commit are crimes against Jehovah. So is fornication and adultery. I'm only pointing this out because fornication and adultery can produce children. <laughs> now, that's not the way to go. And there are examples in the Bible of individuals fornicating and producing children. In individuals adulterating and producing children. But that's not how Father intended his creation to operate. He gave laws and rules as to how his people are to conduct themselves in his earth. Homosexuals and, that, and, and lesbians have to adopt to have a family or have a man impregnate a woman for them to have a child, you see. Childbearing requires a male and a female to procreate. Jehovah created this order, and anyone who violates the order commits sins against him. So laying that out and moving forward, today's men and women that reject these requirements by their actions. You see, if a person decides that they're going to do something contrary to what is written, then what they're saying is their lives is theirs, and they're going to live it as they choose. There was a famous saying when I was growing up, it's my life, <laughs> and I'll live it as I want to. You only go around once. 
You live with all the gusto. There are people, you know, they want to sow their royal oats. <laughs> they want to do all these kinds of things. And then there's the macho. And there's the man who believed that his identity is in how many women he can bag or sack or whatever the case may be. And now this trend is moving, you know, not just among males, but among females. Why? Because the world has gone crazy. The world is off its rocker. <laughs> People have hijacked their lives as if they don't have to give an account. And I tell you, it's going to be a sad day unless, some, of course, people do some repenting and some changing and get back in alignment with the Almighty. A mother taking ownership of children she produces is like a field taking ownership of its crop. Can you imagine that? The seed goes into the ground. It grows, it starts producing, and the ground says, hold it. Those are my, those are my plants. Those are my fruit. <laughs> it's a cycle, folks. And there are too many individuals who are laying claim to their children without giving or acknowledging the one who gave them the children and raising those children up the way he says they are to be raised. And so in this particular passage, what the Almighty does is that he lays it out to them. One, looking at their history, you can't get pregnant unless I enable you to. Two, the children that you're going to give, that you're going to conceive, there's going to be a process and a period of time to where you are not going to be in a state to where you would be considered to be clean or pure. All of this is my doing. And one of the, the things that he's going to make clear is that, listen, it's for you now to follow the instruction when you have a male or when you have a female because all of us are answerable to him. Now, we don't have to follow these instructions. We can rebel. I don't advise it. But that's where the world is. The world, through ignorance or just simply rejection of information and knowledge, is rebelling against the instructions of the Almighty. If the religious world can cause the people of Jehovah who call him Father, who pray our Father who, is, who are in heaven. People still pay, pray those prayers, right? I do. And yet, do not acknowledge. I was thinking of something else this morning, which, you know, is a simple concept, but it seems so foreign. So many times I've heard people tell me that their favorite Psalm is the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. And I say, well, you know, now if the Lord is your shepherd, then what does the shepherd do? The shepherd leads. If the Lord is your shepherd, then who's supposed to be leading you? Can the Lord be your shepherd and he not lead you? Interesting thought. It's, it's, it's easy to quote scripture. It's another thing to live the scripture you quote. It's one thing to say what you believe. It's another thing to practice what you believe. Too many people are saying one thing, but then they're doing something else. And then when you, when you call them on it, they say, I know, I know. Well, do you really know? Because if you really know, you'll do. Do you simply have the knowledge of or you honor him with your lips? Because the proof of the pudding is in the eating. If I say I believe something, then my life should re reflect it in my, in my actions. If the woman and man confess or believe their child is from Jehovah, they show by their actions if that is true or not. Otherwise, they say one thing with their mouth and do something else 
fulfilling what the prophets and Yeshua said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. We don't want to be that people. Yeshua said in Matthew 15, this people draw nigh unto me with their mouth. Who is he talking to? Talking about? He's talking about the people who are supposed to represent the Almighty to the people. The people who are supposed to be teaching the people about Yehovah. But instead, what were they doing? They were teaching them their doctrine. They were teaching them their denominational beliefs. They were teaching them what they had been taught, and this was being passed down from generation to generation. He says, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And then he goes to what they were teaching. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. And so what does Yeshua, com what does Yeshua connect worship to? He connect worship to teaching and obedience to the truth. They worship me in vain, teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. When we worship him in spirit and in truth, what are we doing? We're worshiping him by honoring and walking in the truth of his word. And when this was given, there was no Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in Acts and Corinthians and all of Paul's writings. The commandments that they, were that they were teaching were traditions. They weren't teaching the commandments of Jehovah. And then, over the period of time, prior to the children of Israel being given the instructions of the tabernacle, they were given instructions on how they were to live according to the word of Jehovah. Then the instructions of the tab tabernacle was given, and individuals now had the tabernacle as a focal point for the presence of the Almighty. When the tabernacle ceased or the glory cloud ceased once they went into the land, then there was the building of the temple until exiling into Babylon, then coming out in the second temple. And of course, after Herod's temple was destroyed, people began to associate the commandments to the temple because of words in certain versions of the Bible concerning ceremonial clean or being ceremonial connecting clean and uncleanness with ceremonies. And now it's being Levitical. So all of this continual evolving <laughs> of the word has led people to believe that we can't do certain things because there is no temple. And ultimately, all the laws now are connected to the temple, and because there is no temple, the laws are no longer valid. The laws weren't given because they were, they were a temple. The laws were given to us to show us how to conduct ourselves in the presence of the Almighty amongst one another and to invoke the blessings and protection of the Almighty in our lives. The people of the world, there were... There were there were many, many nations long before the Almighty established the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel was to be established to be an example to all the other nations of the world. When I see the things that are happening in the world, I have to, I have to dis divorce myself from it because that doesn't represent the kingdom that I represent. The world is going to do what the world does, folks. The world is going to be worldly. Yeshua said it very clearly, the world hates me. What do you think it's going to do about you? Because anyone that tells the world that what you all are doing is wrong is going to have a problem with you. Forget the fact that you're talking about what's in the Bible. You're talking about that antiquated, old-fashioned, old book. Nobody lives like that anymore. Come on. Well, why are you going to church? Well, we are, we're, we're operating in a, in a new way. See, we're doing things in a new way. It's like, okay, so the old way is no longer important or valid to the Almighty. Well, that's kind of how it's interpreted. 
He says, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. The man, the woman, and the children they produce all belongs to Jehovah. There are no exceptions. There are no exceptions. Everyone does not acknowledge that. The process in this passage is a reminder of who is responsible to whom. Verse 2, speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman have conceived seed and born a male child, a man child, then she shall be unclean seven days, according to the days of the separation for infirmity shall she be unclean. Now the word unclean here is teme, to be unclean, to become unclean. And it's used unclean for the most defile, pollute. Separation here is the, the Hebrew for nida. And nida implicates or means impurities, filthiness, menstruous, set apart. And then, you know, I, I left this ceremonial impurity because somehow the individuals who, who made the, who gave the definition associated nida with being ceremonial or ceremonially unclean. Now, from a person who don't understand the structure of the tabernacle or how the temple was structured, one would get the impression that a woman who was, who was ceremonially unclean based on the scripture couldn't go to the sanctuary. Well, even when she was clean, she couldn't go to the sanctuary. Because the only person who can go to the sanctuary was the priest. The closest a person could go who weren't a priest is to the door of the tabernacle. Now, with the temple, when they made all these courts, the, the, the structure of the tabernacle was in the innermost part of the temple, whereas there was a point to where no person who wasn't a priest could enter. And this was a portion where you had the tabernacle structure inside the temple and then in the temple courts where when people say, well, you know, they went to the temple, Yeshua went up to the temple, he overturned the tables of the money changers. He was in the temple courts. People look at the whole structure of the temple as if it's the temple when the tabernacle portion of the temple was still restricted to the priests. Inside the tabernacle or the temple part of the, or the tabernacle part of the temple, if you would, there was the, the, the courtyard for the priest, the brazen altar, the, the, the golden laver or the brazen laver. This is where the priest washed, the altar where they put the sacrifices. And then there was the holy place. This is where the menorah and the table of showbread and the altar of incense and then the holy of holies, which is where the, the most holy place, which is where the Ark of the Covenant was. No person outside of the priesthood could go into the courtyard where the brazen altar was. But they can go into the temple courts. And there was a variety of spaces within the temple courts that they could go to. And when people went into the temple courts, the Bible translated as they went into the temple. And this is where a lot of the confusion comes in. So when it comes down to be ceremonially unclean, what that refers to is that if there is a sacrifice that is going to be offered by the, by the family, the woman couldn't touch it if she was nidah. But the man couldn't go inside the temple court, inside the tabernacle. Everybody came where? To the door. And so this whole nidah, it had absolutely nothing to do with sacrifices or the temple or the tabernacle, unless, of course, there was an offering that was going to be offered. But then, even then, when it came down to the purification, when it was over, there were specific set offerings that had to be given. We'll see that in a moment. Infirmity here is used this one time to be ill. Now, it's interesting that what the passage says, that she 
is according to the days of her separation, Nida, for her illness, she will be unclean. Now, anyone who knows or who have witnessed a woman who has become pregnant during that period of time, there are challenges that, that take place in that, in, that, in that body. There are feelings and emotions. There are, are words that are expressed. There are a lot that a, that a woman over the course of that time go through. And what this particular passage speaks to is that, okay, there's blood that is, that is flowing, that is coming um, from her, and, and, and there's, there's feelings. I've heard of morning sicknesses and other types of illnesses or issues that go on, but the scripture here calls it an infirmity. And then she shall be tame, to be unclean, impure. Now, this separation again, Nadal, we looked at that. And if a woman have an issue, let's go back. If a woman, Leviticus 15, this is the nida. So we're going to jump ahead and then we're going to come back. If a woman have an issue of her ish, if a woman have an issue and her issue in her flesh be blood, she shall be put apart how many days? Seven days. And whosoever toucheth her shall be unclean unto when? The evening. And everything that she lieth upon in her separation shall be unclean. Everything also that she sitteth upon shall be unclean. And whosoever touches her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And whoever toucheth anything that she set upon shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. Now, when we came into the Torah, we had to deal with how we deal with this. How do we deal with this whole issue of uncleanness? Because nobody in my family has ever practiced that. Nobody I know has ever practiced that. And then there are people, nobody in the churches that I know ever talked about it, ever practiced that. Because these kinds of things, it seems as if you find them in Leviticus. Just like the food laws in Leviticus. And so there are things about Leviticus that deals with clean and unclean that because people avoid Leviticus, they don't have a clue as to what it is. And it's easy to eat things and to do things when you're ignorant because there's no conviction. And the only conviction is somebody who's coming to you saying, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. And your response, at least my response used to be, is that we're not under that. That's for those people. As long as, as I could divert it to somebody else, I'm not responsible so it don't apply to me and therefore I can continue to do whatever it is I'm doing. Not recognizing what is clean and unclean. And now I, I can't fully understand what Paul writes about, you know, as it is, it is spoken, as he said, come out from among, among them and be ye separate, touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. I will be your Elohim, you shall be my people. Unclean thing? Unclean thing? I don't remember reading nothing about no unclean thing. Oh, 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 yes, I do. Yes, I do. The man who had a son with an unclean spirit. Now, everything becomes a spirit. Uncleanness becomes a spirit. You see. That's, that's, that's where ignorance now take root and then begin to formulate doctrine out of that I ignorance. And next thing you know, you, you, you're spiritualizing everything and taking it out of the realm in which it was given. And so, And if it be on her bed or on anything wherein she sitteth, when he touches it, he shall be unclean. And if any man lie with her at all. Now, I remember, I remember in high school and, and, and in the military and individuals talking to where for some people it was no big deal for them to continue in their normal relationship when a woman was on her period. 
or, or she was on her cycle. And the Bible says that if a man lie with her at all and her flowers be upon him, he shall be unclean how long? Seven days. And all the bed whereon he lieth shall be unclean. It's like I never heard this stuff before. I see why people didn't read Leviticus. Because <laughs> there's some stuff you read in Leviticus, it's like, okay, wait a minute. Hold on, hold on. Okay, let's skip to do the, do, let's go, let's go to number, well, no, let's move on. Let's go to do the, no, let's, let's just go to Joshua. <laughs> that's, that's where we'll start our memory verses from, right? <laughs> Because all this other stuff, I mean, we may, we may pull a few things out of Genesis because Abraham is in there. And maybe from Isaac. I remember, you know, and Isaac sowed, he sowed and he reaped a hundredfold. <laughs> you know, in a, in, a, in a famine. He sowed in a famine. I mean, I had some preachers, man, they would take that verse and next thing you know, they got lines, people in the $500 lines, people in the $1,000 lines because, hey, you may be in a famine. It may be rough out there for y'all. You may be looking at your pocketbook and you don't see a whole lot there. But let me tell you about one man. <laughs> I can hear him saying. <laughs> and then they start talking about Isaac, how in, in, a, in a famine he sowed. When it was rough, he sowed. When everybody else was, was, was going hungry, he sowed. And he reaped a thousandfold. You know, they just, go, they just go crazy on that. It is like, man, okay, all right, all right, all right. But now it's a matter of really understanding what Leviticus is teaching us. It says, and in the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be, be circumcised. Now, how long is she unclean? Seven days. So what happens on the eighth day? <laughs> if she's only unclean for seven days, is she unclean on the eighth day? No. At that particular point, and we're going to see in the next verse that it transitions from being unclean to being purification period. Which there are some restrictions, but she's no longer nida. Now there are restrictions and we have to look at the restrictions that is required during that period of time versus the first seven days as a male child and two weeks as a female child. In the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. That's if it's a male. And that word, foreskin, it doesn't tell us what body part, but I think we all know what that means, at least how it's been practiced, circumcised or uncircumcised. To circumcise is to let oneself be circumcised, to cut, to be cut off. And what is to be cut off? The foreskin the foreskin of the seed producer, well, let me put it, the seed releaser. <laughs> See, now, now, now this, is what, this, this is what connects a holy woman and a holy man, even though the woman is not required to be circumcised. You see this? That, that, that that man and the, and the seed releaser enables her to be able to conceive and together as they are becoming one, as they're supposed to become one, then what you will find is that the Almighty has created a perfect balance and harmony in his creation. Circumcision was only required for the male. For the male was the seed producer. Women conceived seed, but could not produce seed. The flesh of the foreskin shall be circumcised in order to enter into the covenant of Abraham. And one of the reasons why people throw out 
circumcision today is because Abraham, they say, well, Abraham was by faith, not because of some law or not because of. Well, Abraham, by faith, he and the Almighty entered into a covenant that sealed that relationship by faith. Without the covenant, there would not be a seal of the relationship. So no, Abraham was not circumcised when he and the Almighty had conversation, but the conclusion of that conversation entered into a covenant, and that's the covenant of circumcision. Chapter 17, I'm going to rush through this. I might even tell you, you need to read it yourself, but I I need to. um, And when Abram was 90 years old, and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and t- said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Shall thou, neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore you and your seed after thee in their generation. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your seed after you. Every man child among you shall be circumcised and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin and it shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man child in your generation, he that is born in the house or bought with the money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in the house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Now, he, here's the thing that I, that I uh, my parents circumcised my, me and my, my, my brothers. We don't know why. I don't know why they circumcised us. It wasn't on the eighth day. It was in the hospital. And then when I had children, I circumcised them. Why? I don't know why other than my parents circumcised us. You see. Now, when I started thinking about that, I wonder if it's connected to this somehow. I can't say it is. I can't say it isn't, but here's what I can say. The Almighty established circumcision. And circumcision was established as a covenant between the Almighty and Abraham and his seed after him. And what I found myself doing is practicing what my parents had did, even though I had no understanding as to why. I'm glad I did, but I didn't know why. Knowing what I know today If I was able to go back, I would wait until the eighth day before I circumcised my son. Why? Because that's what the instructions say. The consolation is is that when Abraham got circumcised, he was 99, Ishmael was 13, and his whole house, no matter what age they were, were all circumcised. So that gives me some solace in the fact that I wasn't circumcised on the eighth day. But now with the knowledge we have, we can't remain ignorant as we were before because now it's a matter of teaching the next generation who hopefully will teach the next generation how to stay in covenant with Jehovah and by being in covenant with Jehovah, expecting every blessing that comes to those who are in covenant with Jehovah. That's the beauty of a covenant. We serve him, and then he do all his other stuff for us. 
We serve him and he do all this other stuff for us. I believe that's what Yeshua was alluding to when he said, seek first the kingdom of Jehovah and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. Now, he didn't go into detail explaining that, but he was talking to a people who had the Torah, the prophets and the Psalms. He wasn't talking to a New Testament mindset of people. He was talking to a people who already knew what the word of Jehovah said, but was deviating based on their traditions. Not only that, one cannot become the offspring or seed of Abraham by faith without entering into the covenant of Abraham. And notice, too, the foreskin of the heart is to be circumcised also as a requirement according to the Torah. This is what Deuteronomy says, verse 10, chapter 10, verse 15. Only Jehovah had a delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you above all people, as it is this day. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. Most New, New Testament people want to make you think that circumcising the foreskin of your heart is a New Testament concept. No, the children of Israel, just as Jehovah said, I'm making you holy, now be holy. I'm setting you apart, now be set apart. And given his instructions, now you circumcise the foreskin of your flesh, that's a physical, but now you also need to circumcise your heart. Why? Because out of the heart comes the issues of life. If, if your heart being evil, then what are you going to produce? You're going to produce evil. But if what's in your heart is his and it's good and it's holy, then what's going to come out of it? What's going to come out of your mouth is going to reflect what's in your heart out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. What's going to be your actions is going to be a reflection of what, what is in your heart. It's not what goes in a man that makes him unclean. It's what comes out of a man because what comes out of a man comes out of his heart. You see. And so now it's a matter of circumcising that heart, making sure that what you are producing that is coming from the heart is holy in the presence of Jehovah. So it says, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked, for Jehovah your Elohim is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God is a mighty and terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. So he's no respecter of persons. On the eighth day of a male child, she transitions from the seven days of Nadah to a purification period of 30 days and for a total of 40 days. So Luke makes re reference to this commandment pertaining to Mary when he wrote, and when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Yeshua, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And she shall then continue, Leviticus 12, in the blood of her purifying three and 30 days. She shall touch no hallowed thing, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purifying be fulfilled. And purifying here is Tahora is cleansing. Once she moves past the Nadar stage, she goes into the cleansing stage. And this is where her body begins to cleanse itself. This is how the creator designed it. Now, when it comes down to what's, what's interesting here is that during this cleansing process, the rules kind of change a little bit. It doesn't have the same rules about the bed and all of that as it did under the seven days of purification or the seven days of Nidah. The restrictions now becomes a little bit different. During the period of purification, cleansing, every commandment required was a reminder of who they were responsible to. The man, the woman, and the child had commands given. The woman was impure. The man could not touch the woman without becoming impure. The child had to be circumcised on the eighth day and could not be presented to Jehovah until after the purification process. And all of these commandments had to be completed as required by Jehovah. So if she bears a maid or female, she would be Nadal for two weeks. At which time she transitions to 66 days of purification for a total of 80 days. But if she bear a maid, maid child, then she shall be unclean two weeks, as in her separation, and she shall continue in the blood of her purifying three score and six days. 
And when the days of her purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation unto the priest. Now, this is where the ceremonial part comes in. But she doesn't go into the sanctuary. She brings her purification offering, a burnt offering, and a sin offering to the door of the tabernacle. Why? Because now she's been purified by the purification process, and she can now come to the place, the door, and present her offering. Who shall offer it before Jehovah and make an atonement for her, and she shall be cleansed from the issue of her blood. This is the law for her that hath born a male or female. And if she be not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtles, or two turtles, which is turtle doves, or two young pigeons. The one for the burnt offering and the other for a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for her, and she shall be clean. Now, Luke also makes reference to this commandment pertaining to Mary, because once her purification was over, she came into the temple courts. She interacted with people. <laughs> and when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. So they brought the Lord to present him to the Lord. <laughs> You see that? So, finally, people who reject Jehovah's law pay no attention to the commandments surrounding childbirth and purification. Some argue these laws are no longer valid because there is no temple, and the laws in this category are for ceremonial cleanness for temple purposes, but the laws were given without a tabernacle or a temple. Others argue these laws are for the prevention of spreading potential infections or diseases. No matter... The argument, the truth is simple. Jehovah said it, and that settles it. Now, I know that many people have to have some kind of understanding before they can apply. There are certain instructions that the Almighty gives us understanding. He explains them. There are certain things he just don't explain to us. And those things that, that he doesn't explain to us doesn't necessarily relieve us from obeying his commands, especially if we want his blessing. So even though I may not understand, I don't understand why I circumcised my child when they was in the, you know, but I did. And even today, it's like, it still didn't register. But again, I'm glad that I did. It wasn't explained. And, and looking back over my life and being, I can say in my, in, my, in my own heart, there were things that were put in me that even though I did not understand, they were germinating. It's like that word, the seed, that is, that is in you and is causing a behavior to emanate from you. It, 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 it kind of puts certain restrictions. You know, you go to the edge, but you don't jump off. You, you cross a few lines, but there are certain lines you just don't cross. And I, don't, I didn't understand that, but I'm understanding a whole lot more now as I'm reading and learning and growing and especially um, communicating to others with the understanding that the Almighty has given me from these things. So, um, I'm going to stop there, give you opportunities to, to ask questions or comments um, or seek clarification if something uh, was said that was unclear. And it's important um, if you have a question or comment that you, that you ask it or make it. Amen? Anyone? Okay, we have a question from Tina. 
How did they have or practice a holy convocation when they came into the promised land before the synagogue system? Before the synagogue system, they had the, the synagogue system didn't even come into effect until after the Babylonian captivity. In fact, it is believed that the great synagogue was established in Babylon. So there was no synagogue system in the wilderness. There was no synagogue system once the people came into the land. There was a temple system. Uh, and after the kings and the temple was destroyed and the people were carried off into Babylon, it wasn't until the New Testament do we even see the idea of a synagogue. So the synagogue system came from Babylon. It didn't exist prior to the New Testament. We have a comment from Shayla. Shalom, Arthur and HOI. Shalom. It seems that there are two different instances of a man lying with a woman during her flow. In Leviticus 15, 24, it appears to be that her flow unintentionally gets on him because they are sleeping in the same bed versus Leviticus 20:18, which seems to indicate intentional relations. Intentional relations during the da are forbidden. See, I, I know, you know, once, once we, I went into chapter 15 for the purpose of explaining what the separation was in chapter 11. As we continue to go, a lot of those um, questions we're going to deal with from a more in-depth perspective. And, and, and the bottom line is that when a woman is on her, when a woman is nada, what the Almighty is saying that whoever touches her is going to be unclean. The issue with how long they're going to be unclean will be de determined by the interaction. If 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 um, he sits or or, or or touches her or um, some of her flow gets on her, it's a difference between them having relationship with one another because if that be the case, then the whole term according to Leviticus 15 is going to be where she's going to be completely, he's going to have to now go through the whole seven day period. So father forbid that kind of behavior and activity between a man and a woman when she's in the dark. But we'll get, we'll get into that a little bit more because there's there's other aspects. I only pulled that piece out of, of, of Leviticus 15, but there's so much more there in Leviticus 15. And I know when I went there that it opened me up, but now we're into Leviticus chapter 20 and, and, and we're way ahead. We'll, we'll get there. Okay, we have a praise report from Jackie. The surgical wound site on my foot is officially healed and closed up. Praise him. Amen. Thank you, Brother Arthur, and everyone for your prayers. Amen. Yes. Just a thought um, uh, concerning circumcision and the cutting away of the flesh and foreskin. Um, what we seem to be, or what the context indicates, is the seed to come, that seed which was spoken of in the garden. And this is the promise that's made. And the nations, you know, which will be the believers who, you know, through Yeshua, will enter in. So it's not by the flesh that the seed will come. It's by the Spirit of God. And Isaac was a miracle birth, just as Yeshua was. Mm -hmm. So it's just... I haven't really fleshed it all out, but I see the cutting away of the flesh, even in the foreskin of our heart, as the same thing, you know, that it is God, mm -hmm. not by man's works. Yeah. When I look at the, um, the garden situation, that particular, that particular um, instruction that the Almighty gives to the woman is not going to materialize until Yeshua. No other person is going to fill that particular role because that is specifically 
related to the one who will come and restore order. The circumcision concerning Abraham has to deal with the covenant that people enter into. And this is where every male is now required to be circumcised. This is a physical act that the woman and the man who has uh, been given that child is to circumcise that child and to bring that child into covenant with the Most High. When it comes down to the circumcision of the heart, the Almighty, I believe, gives us his word. And this is not some surgical process whereby we now, because he, he says to the people, you circumcise your heart, just as he says to the people, you circumcise that child on the eighth day. He's not going to come down and circumcise that child on the eighth day. The circumcision of our heart, I believe, comes from us walking in obedience to his word, which is going to now cut away whatever is of us that we want to do and cause us to walk in harmony and sync with him and what he's calling us to. That's how I understand it. Any other comments, questions? Anybody, if you got a question, Mackenzie, there's the mic. Don't be shy, but you're going to have to speak into it. Okay? So, huh? Put your big girl voice on it. There we go. I just wanted to praise the Lord that this week I have not had one pain attack nor headache since my head injury. Praise him. Praise him. Amen. Yes, sir. Shalom, everyone. Um, I want to thank Jehovah for what he's doing. If you want to, you could, you could just, there you go, and come a little closer. Okay. With, yeah. I want to thank Jehovah for what he's doing in and through me. Um, I had uh, one day surgery today. They had a, um, uh, a loop recorder in my chest. Uh, for about two years and they were trying to figure out what's going on with my heart and they, they nothing was going on it, w- it was every once in a while I feel like I was going to pass out and they said it was lack of oxygen then my heart is weak and a whole lot of things and um, I just felt as though I had to trust Jehovah and by me doing that I didn't worry about it I just allowed that to go on, and today they removed it. Wonderful. And I know that he's doing a great thing in and through me by that. So they took it out completely, and you're not dependent on it? No, I'm not. That's a recorder that sends a signal to the hospital to Mm -hmm. let them know if something's wrong going on with my heart. Mm -hmm. So So now does that mean they don't want to know anymore? Well, that's what it seems like. <laughs> that's what it seems like. And oh, I thought about, yo, yo. yeah, I, th- I thought about the insurance. I don't have the insurance. So they're like, okay, well, he doesn't have the insurance to pay us. So let's just get this out of here. You know? But Ooh. I know that man is doing his thing. Uh-huh. But I know Yeshua is doing the the ultimate thing. Amen. He's controlling and doing what he needs to do in and through me. Praise and I, I trust him, and I thank him for allowing me to be here today. And I stand in faith. Amen. We stand in faith and agreement for that, yes. for your complete healing continuously. Yes. Amen. 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 And, and for those of you, I know that uh, Ms. Karen has made an appeal from time to time asking Especially, I want to thank those of you who have sent in prayer requests and then who are reporting back 
uh, giving us updates on those things that, that you've asked us to be in prayer for. And, and we ask those things so that we can rejoice with you. You know, we take your prayer requests very seriously when you send them in. We pray for them. They're distributed among intercessors. We pray. And so when, when, we, when we get results, please sh share them. And I want to thank the Almighty for um, Maynetta. Maynetta, who has, we prayed for, you, for her. She's come through surgery. She's talking and interacting. And, and thank you, uh, Keisha, for, for sending in that, um, that update on her. Yes, ma'am. I guess while we're in the mode of giving praise reports, um, we got the news today that um, we got a spot that's only about 25, 30 minutes from here. Really? Yep. Cool. And it's less than what we were paying way over in Blacksburg, so. I mean, a spot. So I, a spot I don't, I don't think is people a, know what a spot, spot to means. place our camper because that's where we live is in our For RV. Now. <laughs> For now. For now. For now. Amen. Yeah, I mean, any other comments, praise reports, questions? Yes, we have a question from Samson. Why, why do the Hebrew people turn away from the house of God, the holy place, to a temple? Yeah, that's a, um, the, the tabernacle, I mean, this is where some history goes. Because there were wars, the tabernacle was a temporary type dwelling, um, a temporary type setup, the ark and all of the furnishings in it. And David, David um, had, a, he had a, he had this, this thought. I mean, this is as best as I could get to answering the question. David lived lavishly and he could not stand the fact that he was living in a in a walled house or or, or, or a beautiful house while the, while the ark of, of Jehovah dwelt in a tent and so he made it his business that the Almighty was going to live in a structure more lavish than the structure he lived in. And therefore, he set his heart to build a temple for the Almighty, but because of his life, his past life, things that he had done, the Almighty says, you know, there's too much blood on your hands for you to be able to build me a house. Not that I need a house, but if it's in your heart to build me a house, we'll allow Solomon to do it. And this is how, you know, the, the, the whole idea came from a desire of David um, to build the Almighty a house so that he would be able to dwell in it. And the Father said to, 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 to us and, and, and to the people, there is no house you can build big enough for, for me. And he doesn't need a house to dwell. He doesn't, he doesn't dwell in a house made by hand. But his ultimate plan was to dwell in his people, whereas his preliminary plan was to dwell in the midst of his people. And of course, David wanted to build him a house so that the Ark of the Covenant would have a home similar to how he was living or, or better. And that's how uh, history uh, unfolded on that issue. So it went from a tabernacle to uh, a permanent dwelling because the children of Israel, the tabernacle was portable because they were sojourning. And once they came into the land, they were no longer sojourning. And that's where they now had a permanent, a permanent place to live. Okay. Amen. <laughs> All right. If there are no other questions, no other comments, 
then we're going to give you an opportunity to give. Father in heaven, we just thank you. We thank you for this portion of our time together where we give, get, get the opportunity to give into the work of your kingdom. We pray for those, Father, who, who give, for those who have given consistently, for those who have stood with us, and for those, Father, who are coming into the recognition of who we are and what we represent and believe in the mission and the work that we're doing. I thank you for the person who is contemplating sowing or giving into this work. Pray your blessings upon them and upon their household. We pray none lack as a result of their giving, but to the contrary. Show yourself mighty in the lives of those, Father, who take your command of sowing and reaping, giving, tithe and offerings and first fruits, Father, that you bless them in abundance. Bless them, bless them, bless them. Father, cause your people to have so much abundance that there is no worry, no fear, no apprehension. And we know, Father, that you have the capacity to do that, for we see it in your word, how you have caused your people to prosper as they walk in obedience to your word, not people possessed by money, but people who recognize money as a currency and utilize it for the work of your, of your kingdom in the earth. Prosper your people, Father. Let none lack, but prosper them. And I just bless you and thank you for them. Thank you for those who give into this work. Be glorified in them. In Yeshua's name. Amen. All right. Well, those of you who are joining us online, if you would take a moment on our website, ArthurBaileyMinistries.com, you can go there. And, and you, can, you can support our ministry from there. However, on the donate page, if you go there, you'll find that there are other ways. There are, there are several ways that you can support our ministry, um, several of them that allow you to, to give without incurring any fees from processing. And... There you see ways to give. If you're living in Canada, you can give through this link. If you desire a charitable letter from the Canadian Revenue Service, you must use the Canadian donation link. For other ways to give, you can set up bill pay. So you can give tithe, offerings, world missions, one-time donations, alms, benevolence through Bill Pay, Zelle, Cash App, Venmo, or you can send checks of money or order in the mail, or you can use a one-time donation. You can give through PayPal, friends and family. You can, however you choose to give, we just appreciate your support and your giving in Messiah. Amen? Amen. I do believe there's a few announcements, and, and then we'll, if there are prayer requests, we'll pray. Now, I want to encourage those of you who are on Facebook or YouTube, if you have questions or prayer requests, you want to submit those through the website because that's where we're, we're taking all the, our questions and uh, comments as well as prayer requests from. I know that there are people on Facebook and on YouTube, and we encourage you, if you're chatting on YouTube or Facebook, be nice to one another. Try to keep the conversations relevant to the teaching. I know that there are people who, you know, don't get out much, don't have much interaction with folks. And so every conversation under the sun they want to have on the chat. But be respectful and mindful of other people who are really trying to communicate with one another and get understanding. So if you would be, be sensitive to that and respectful of other people, we certainly uh, appreciate you for it. Yes, ma'am. Yes, we have the second biblical month that started on Monday, May Second, it was cited by several witnesses in Israel. We have, mm -hmm. we have upcoming Friday night Sabbath premieres at 7 p.m. And that is Pentecost 2021, the Feast of Harvest. 
We are also a discipleship center. And personally, when I went through the discipleship center, I noticed that when I was going through some of the old lessons, it helped spread some connections for future lessons. So that's something to look into. Amen. Upcoming Feast of Weeks for the Harvest Pentecost. You can RSV on online under the Feast tab. The service time is June the 12th at 1 p.m. And this Thursday service starts sunset on the day 13th. Ooh, sorry. Now, if you call, believe you're called to be a minister, to have a house assembly or a fellowship or home group, please use the Contact Us service to get in touch. Shalom. Shalom. For those of you who, who are or who may not be aware, um, each week now we are putting new banners on our Facebook page and on our website that are letting you know uh, the upcoming teachings. And so currently uh, we're doing our Friday night premiere teachings. And um, right now, this tomorrow night, we'll be looking at last last uh, Pentecost teaching, the Feast of Harvest. And this is all keeping us in the mindset of counting up to the Feast of Harvest, the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, uh, Shavuos. Also, uh, on Sabbath, we're going to be doing a teaching from Luke on how to overcome the devil. That's the title, How to Overcome the Devil. And so we encourage you uh, to join with us for Pentecost 2021 tomorrow at 7 p.m. And then how to overcome the devil uh, on Sabbath at 11 a.m. Amen. So if there aren't any other questions and no prayer requests, then we'll bring our time to a close. Father, we just thank you so much for your goodness and your mercy. And for those who may not be able to get their prayer requests in in time, Father, we pray that you will hear them and respond favorably. We pray for your healing, for your deliverance, for your presence. We pray for you to meet every need answer every question and every concern. Show yourself mighty in the midst of your people as they seek your face. And we're so thankful that those who put their faith in you will not be ashamed or put to shame. Thank you. Continue to be glorified in the midst of us. Even as we go into our respective places, be glorified, keep us safe. In Yeshua's name, receive your blessing. Jehovah bless you and keep you. Jehovah calls his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. Jehovah lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. All right, saints. Remember, we can't do what we do without you. Your support, your prayers are greatly appreciated. It, appreciated. And until Shabbat, remember tomorrow night, 7 p.m., streaming live, Pentecost 2021, or streaming, live streaming. And then, of course, how to hear how to overcome the devil this Sabbath. So until Shabbat, Shabbat Shalom, saints. Shalom, saints. Tithing and giving first fruit offerings are critical parts of the believer's faith and has its foundation back in Genesis 4-4 when Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And Jehovah had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Abel was commended by Jehovah in Hebrews 11:4, where it states that by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Solomon said in Proverbs 3, 9, and 10, Honor Jehovah with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall your barns be filled with plenty, and your presses shall burst out with new wine. The prophet Malachi wrote in chapter 3, verse 11 and 12, to bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now, he wit, says Jehovah of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there should not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, says Jehovah of hosts.
and all nations shall call you blessed. For you shall be a delightsome land, said Jehovah of hosts. When we tithe and give offerings consistently in obedience to Jehovah's commandments, we can count on him to keep his promises to us and consistently meet all of our needs. It is our Father's desire to bless you. However, it begins with you and your act of obedience to tithe and give offerings. Do it today. Shalom. For more information, visit www.arthurbaileyministries.com or call 888-899-1479. House of Israel International Services is made possible through financial contributions from brothers and sisters like you. Thank you.